Good morning. Today I would like to talk about God. I'd like to talk about God and politics. You see, it used to be that God was big into politics. He picked the original leaders of the people. God picked Abraham. God picked Moses. He inspired the judges like Joshua and Gideon and Samson to lead the people. And eventually, when the Israelites demanded a king, God picked that king. Now, as the line of succession went through the royal bloodlines, God still stayed involved with these leaders. God would speak to the kings, sometimes directly, sometimes through a prophet or a messenger. You see, God was always trying to inspire these kings to follow his way and to lead the people to follow his way. That's how it worked in those days. The leader or the king communicated with God, and then the leader or the king made the people follow God and worship God and keep the commandments. And it would work for a while. It worked really well when you had a good king like David or Solomon. But it would fall apart when you got a bad king like Ahab or Herod. It's very cyclical, the Old Testament. You know, the people get led astray. They get away from God's truth. They get away from God's light. And they're plunged into darkness for a while. And then God would send a messenger or a prophet to lead the people back, to inspire the king, to make the worship of God central to the people's lives again. And it would work for a while until it didn't. And you get another bad king, and it all fall apart again. Our first reading today sums this up pretty well, this cycle that went on for centuries and centuries. It went on over and over until eventually God had had enough. And the Israelites were overrun and carted off to Babylon in exile. God put them in a timeout so that they could think about what they've done. And in our psalm today, they do think about it. They sing about their loss of their freedom and their homeland as they sat by the rivers of Babylon. And then God gets into politics one last time, and he inspires Cyrus, the Persian king. God inspired Cyrus to send the Israelites back to Israel. Cyrus was so inspired that he sent money and supplies to rebuild the temple. That is inspiration. God can inspire anyone, and he can use them in their position to accomplish his will, even a pagan like King Cyrus. So the Israelites were out of exile. They were out of time out. But did the exile in Babylon really work? I mean, were the people really changed? Were they really ready to follow God exclusively? Well, maybe, for a while. But I think the thing that really changed with the Babylonian captivity, the biggest change that happened was that God stopped trying to lead the people back to him through their kings. I think God got out of politics after Babylon. You see, I think that after Babylon, God stopped trying to use political mechanisms like kings and governments to lead the people to worship. I think after Babylon, God stopped relying on politics to bring the people back to their faith. In fact, after Babylon, the Israelite nation was never truly independent again. They were a tribute state. They were under the control of a larger political entity. First, they were under King Cyrus and the Persians. Then they were under the Greeks. And then they were under the Romans. It was always some higher political power than the Israelite king who determined whether they could openly worship Yahweh or not. It was no longer up to the Israelite king to lead the people to God. And new religious leaders emerged, the priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, they all consolidated their power and became the religious authorities in the land, but not the king. By the time we got to Jesus, the time of the Gospels, the Israelite king is an afterthought when it comes to religious affairs. And God didn't concern himself with trying to convert the king and get him to lead the people back to God. God didn't seem to inspire the Persians or the Greeks or the Roman overlords to do anything either. After Babylon, God seems to let politics go. You see, after Babylon, God takes a new approach to his chosen people. It's during this time that we see some of the books of the prophets are written with their predictions of the day of the Lord, the end of times, and a coming Savior, the Messiah. God stops trying to force the people to follow him through their kings, and instead, God sends his son, Jesus, into the world. Not to condemn the world as in the end times, but to save the world, so that everyone who believes in him will be saved, to make salvation an independent choice for each individual. It was no longer dependent on the king to establish worship and ensure that people followed the rules and the commandments the protocols and the procedures. No, with Jesus, the conversion is up to the person. The faith is up to the individual person. We don't need a king to make sure that the priests are observing the proper rituals 
so that we can make our sacrifices for our transgressions at the proper festivals in the proper format in order to communicate with God. No, with Jesus, we can pray and communicate with God any time. We don't need a sacrifice of a lamb or a dove or a calf to burn on an altar for our sins because Jesus has taken the place of all blood sacrifices. God doesn't need to control the political power of the nation to ensure worship because Jesus has bridged that gap for us. That's why the curtain that hung in the temple, separating the holy of holies from the people, the curtain that kept God hidden from view of the people, that curtain was torn in two when Jesus died on the cross because we're no longer separated from God. We're no longer kept at a distance. We are welcomed into the light. Welcomed with open arms. God does not have to be involved in politics anymore to force the people to follow him. Because with Jesus, faith is no longer an affair of the state. It is an affair of the heart. And when Jesus came into contact with political rulers and leaders of state, he did not inspire them in the way that God had inspired Cyrus. Jesus didn't cause the politicians to lead a revival. Now, he could have, of course, if he wanted to. Jesus could have inspired King Herod to convert to the way and come into the light to spread the gospel throughout Israel. And Jesus could have inspired Pilate to convert and follow the gospel way and spread that message throughout the region. God had inspired Cyrus, so it is possible for Jesus to inspire a political ruler, even a pagan like Pontius Pilate. Jesus could have done those things. Jesus could have gotten the kings and the leaders all straightened out. Jesus could have led a mass conversion to Christianity through the mechanisms of the state of Israel. But playing politics is not how Jesus operates. Trying to force conversion of heart through legislative and political process does not work. It didn't work for thousands of years of Israelite history. You can't make people believe and follow God. You cannot force salvation on them. It just doesn't work. Jesus shows us the way that works in our gospel today. He says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him might not perish, but might have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him will not be condemned. Whoever believes. You see, by placing the emphasis on the individual's conversion and faith, Jesus places the responsibility and the agency with the individual person as well. It is on each of us to love and serve the Lord. It's not up to the state to make us. We don't need a human priest, prophet, or king to tell us right from wrong, light from dark, because Jesus is our priest, our prophet, and our king, and he is with us always, even to the end of the age. You see, Jesus is with us in our heart, telling us to let go of the darkness, to come into the light. And we know what the light is. We know what the dark is. Whoever lives in the truth comes to the light, so that his works may be clearly seen as done in God, Jesus says. He calls us to live in the truth, to come to the light. So God is not trying to get this political leader or that political leader into power, despite what some religious folks tell us. God is not trying to legislate morality or spirituality through the mechanisms of government. And despite our own Catholic attempts at this throughout history, that's just not what God is trying to do. God is trying to save our souls, each one of our souls, through a personal conversion and relationship with Jesus Christ, a relationship that is up to each of us individually to work on and cultivate God is not going to inspire the king to make us or anybody else be a better Christian. That is not his plan. God's plan is that he loves us, so he sent his son, so that everyone who believes in him might not perish, but might have eternal life. That's God's plan, that we'll be saved, that we'll tell others so that they can be saved. So don't wait for the king to save our souls. Instead, start working on God's plan for salvation because God's plan is the only plan that actually works.